Can you guys hear me? Well, this is unfortunate. It is locked in the vertical way. Okay, okay. We can go with it. Okay, my friends, so here we are at the Saturday morning live stream, Garden Like a Viking headquarters here in zone 5B, 6A, Northern Indiana. And we got all kinds of stuff to talk about today because it is well on its way. The season is coming and we're having a small break in the uh, weather right now because it has been really rainy and foggy, uh, which is a good thing. But uh, right now it's a little bit sunny, even though it says on the weather forecast that it is currently fully clouded. But okay, so let me see where you guys are from. Uh, say hello and wherever you're from. And yeah, this time we got locked on the vertical method of the uh, screen, so we're just gonna have to roll with it. So, let's see, let's go back up and see what you guys are saying. Uh, uh, let's see, oh wow, you guys have been talking for a while. Okay, says, uh, Jerome says, greetings from Zone 5A, Wisconsin. Grateful for all you do and share with us, thank you. You are very welcome, my friend, I'm glad that you are here. Marcel, good to see you again. He says, hello, my friend, happy to be here on time. Yes, I think maybe I was one minute late today. Well, yeah, I know. Because the phone kept trying to make me tag some products. It wouldn't let me go live. And so I was like, what? So I had to figure out how to go around it and then I turned it vertical and now it's locked in the vertical position, but whatever. Gotta roll with it. So Dahav says, life's a garden, dig it or don't dig it if that's your preferred method. Hello from Colorado. Uh, hello, my friend. Iowa Viking says, hello. I'm digging in a worm bin right now. Very nice. Jerome, I'm working on building my worm bin today. New first-time grower of all things. So much info to learn and weed through. Mm, good one. Weed through. Oki Ranch Wife, hello, my friend. Says, uh, I am preparing to pressure can freshwater fish that a friend caught and gave to me. Very nice. How long do you pressure can that for? I have not pressure canned fish yet. How do you do it? You just fillet it and put it in there and then um, pressure can it. 30 minutes, uh, 45 minutes, 15 pounds. What is it? Uh, no way. It says, where is he? Yeah, I know. I know. Not like me to be even one minute late. Linda Lowe. Hello, my friend from Zone 6B, Kentucky. Val. Hey, from Northern Arizona, the Mile High City. I thought that was Colorado. And uh, let's see here, my friends. So... We would get rain, Marcel, okay. Fort Knox, let's see. My favorite part of Saturday starts now. Hello, Marcel, yes, good, good, me too. My favorite part. Uh, Wes, Rita Welch, good morning from West Central Georgia. Let's see, Miss Valmark says, had a pop-up hailstorm and tornado that completely destroyed the very garden we spoke about last week. Didn't have the heart to clean up until this morning. Reseeded a bit. Yes, I think you are the one that sent me the pictures. That's right. You emailed me the pictures and it is devastating, man. A nice garden that just, boom, hammered with a bunch of um, hail and debris and everything is just, I mean, it's like it's been beat down, like shot with shotguns. Yeah. But fortunately, you still have plenty of time. And that's the thing. Even, that's why it's good to start as early as possible because even if it... Uh, uh, I guess hailstorm and everything fails or gets beat down, you still have time to replant, and that is so important. Okay, so uh, I wish you the best of the energy. I know how that can feel, man. I've planted gardens before and have the whole thing uh, wiped out by slugs before, and just been like waiting for seeds to come up and stuff. I I thought when I came back here from Cal when I came back here from California, I thought that I was gonna direct seed everything like I did in California a lot, uh, but things just don't grow the same here. So, uh, and there's different pests and all that kind of stuff. And so um, I, uh, I was waiting for the seeds to come up and then nothing was coming up and I was like, what is the problem? And then I come to find out late at night with the headlamps and stuff that the seeds were coming up, they were just getting annihilated by uncountable amounts of slugs. Yeah, so. Slug video coming soon. That was many years ago though. Now I don't have a problem with slugs. One, because this garden area has reached a sort of equilibrium to where you know the predators come in and the pest predator relationship. When you first start a garden in a new area, you don't have that, um, but now we do. So, morning all. Yes, Mathicus, uh, Ehab, hello my friend. Nancy Kago, blessings from Chattanooga. I successfully made my first kombucha. Oh, nice. Isn't it wonderful? Yes, hello from Chattanooga. 
man, a lot of you guys from Chattanooga. Tara Mullins from Alabama and Tennessee Line. Yes, okay. Okay, so guys, let's see. Let me jump to the beginning where you're asking these questions. Okay, Four Points Homestead says, Howdy from Texas. Thanks to Pinball, I found your channel. Wish I would have found you sooner. I would be light years ahead in my garden endeavor. Yes, my friend, that is probably true, but let us not lament because you have found us now. And so there's tons of information on the channel, all kinds of... Um, of uh, videos and stuff like that, lots of knowledge there, and the lives, you know, we, we share a lot of knowledge in the lives, so be sure to watch the back videos, the lives, all that stuff, and uh, if you don't see something, then you can ask, and I can probably answer it, or I can, maybe I can make a video about it, so that would be good. Uh, Val says, I'm overrun by aphids, what can I do? Yes, aphids are an issue. Now, um, I don't know if you guys saw my slug video last year, but I'm going to make a slug video this year that also works for aphids and uh, pretty much any soft-bodied creature. But the thing is that you have to you have to hit it on them. You have to actually get the solution onto the soft-bodied creature, and uh, that is important. So, uh, man, I wish this was not locked in the in the vertical method. I do not like the vertical method because I can't use my hands. You know, I got to be all crunched up in the center and everything. But oh well, it's, uh, it wouldn't let me change it. So Marcel says, question, can you grow baby maros from the seeds we find in them? Baby maros? What is maros? I'm not sure. That must be a South African slang because we don't have those here. Um, so yes, Val, you will want to um, overrun by aphids. Yeah, so there will be a solution coming that involves a uh, fresh garlic bulb and the Jadam wetting agent and um, some sodium hydroxide, okay? So the wetting agent, guys, if you have not already made it, go ahead and make it, all right? And uh, I made a video on how to make it pretty easily, and so you remember, this one was made with uh, not soft water. This one was made with just tap water, which here is about 280 parts per million. And you see how cloudy it is? We don't want that. This was made with reverse osmosis water at zero parts per million. You see how clear that is? This is a lot more effective, way more effective. And uh, so it's very important. You see the difference? It's very important to utilize the right type of water when you're making the Jadam wetting agent. And this is really the foundation of all the natural pesticides. So the um, aphid problem that you're having, Val, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to center around this. I mean, this is so important. We're going to use three ounces of this to the gallon of water. We're going to use, we're going to prepare the, the garlic bulb in a special way that you'll see in the video. And then we're going to add two teaspoons of the sodium hydroxide. And uh, that is really the secret weapon. That's what melts the slugs or the cabbage worms or the aphids or whatever you get it on. But it starts with this. If you don't have this, you can use the peppermint brawners, the Dr. Brawners Castile soap. Uh, it will work similarly, but not as effective. This stuff. It's like Castile soap, but it's much more effective somehow. It's more concentrated. There's something about it. So, yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, Mary Lou says, Hi from Montana. Hey, I could not find the video on the stuff you use five times. I'm the one that had the potato blight last year. Okay, yes, Mary. Then uh, you... Okay, it's. Uh, I made it about a month, maybe month and a half ago, and you just have to go into the videos and go down a little bit. It says, make this solution five times before planting, and I'm holding like a water heater. Uh, it says, or you can just type in JDOM wetting agent uh, to the search bar, and that will find it. Or maybe I'll put a link to that one in the description uh, after this after this um, chat here. So, Kip Tap, $10, thank you very much, my friend. Says, always great info. Beard still? Yeah, I know. I know, uh, I've been saying I've been going to cut it for a long time, but I'm actually doing it this time because today I am on day seven of the Master Cleanse. So it has been seven days since I've had anything solid to eat. I've just been having the lemonade and the maple syrup uh, mixture, and um, I'm feeling fantastic, of course. But this cleanse has been really eye-opening to me in the sense that I realize that I pretty much always feel fantastic now. It used to be in my life when I would come to the master cleanse, I would have like things I needed to cleanse from, you know, I, and I would, because I lived a rather, I mean, somewhat toxic lifestyle in the years past. But then after this handful of years, uh, and now the lifestyle that I live is uh, 
just so clean. And so now I pretty much am just realizing that, man, I always feel crystal clear in the mind. I always feel energized and light and all of these things. So, uh, yeah, but it's still good to do a tune up. It's definitely still good to do a tune up. The cleanse always teaches you something. Uh, let's see here. Is there a benefit to giving your seedlings pure magnesium chloride crystals mixed with water? Magnesium chloride crystals. No, I don't think so. I don't know why you would need to do that. What are you trying to, um, what are you trying to counteract? The only thing that you need to feed your seedlings is the compost extract. And, uh, yes, because these tomatoes, see this one got really dry though, that this one. So these leaves are a little bit drooping right now because I just hit it with some water. It was as light as styrofoam, but, um, so these will perk back up here shortly, but this is a very nice, healthy Cherokee purple plant. And by the time it goes outside, it's gonna be probably this tall. It's gonna be nice and thick. You see, it doesn't fall over or anything. It's really stout and uh, it's got plenty of vigor and life in it. And uh, so the only thing that I give this, that I give any of the seedlings is the compost extract. That is uh, all that they need really. So. I don't know about your the crystals you're talking about, but uh, there's no need if you're using high quality compost extract mixed with an ounce a gallon of the fish fertilizer. Um, so that's pretty much all that I give these. And the pepper plants, you know, deep dark green, the pepper plants are loving it. They're doing pretty good. And uh, the tomatoes are doing good. It's a Cherokee purple plant. So when I go to plant this tomato, guys, I'm gonna clip this uh, one off and I'm gonna clip this one off. And so then I'm going to plant it. I'm going to bury it all the way up to here. The ground will be right here. And so uh, tomatoes are one of those things. Most of you probably know this, but tomatoes are one of those things that can grow uh, roots out of its stem if it's in contact with the ground. So uh, by cutting off this one and cutting off this one and burying it up to here, uh, it's going to have a lot deeper of a root system. And that's the same thing I did when I, I, cause I started these in the cubes in the soil blocks, but then they needed up potted. So I just put it into here all the way pretty much to the bottom and then buried most of the thing in the soil. And now it's, uh, you know, so that just the top was exposed. Every time that you transplant a tomato plant, you want to do it so that the, uh, so that you bury as much as possible. So that just like this much is left to the top. And uh, some people like to do it sideways as well. You can do it, oops, you can do it sideways as well, but um, I've not found any difference really. I don't, haven't found that it, there's no reason uh, to do that. Moondust says, my tomatoes are long and thin when transplanting. Can I just bury it deeper or no? Yes, you can bury it deeper. Uh, they're long and thin probably because they don't have enough light. That is going to be pretty much the number one uh, thing is that they need more light. So if you have tomatoes that are kind of lanky and they have long internodal spacing, you know, long spaces in between the nodes like this, uh, this is kind of a short internodal spacing, but if there's real long before the next um, node, the next branch, then they are seeking out light and probably too moist. So you can adjust your parameters. You can adjust your operation to, um, to compensate for that. But yes, you can bury it deeper. So uh, let's see. Ehab says, I plan on detoxing more often so that I don't need to do a cleanse anymore. It was an interesting journey though. I prefer the coffee detox method like in the Gerson program, it's a powerful detox. Did you do the full master cleanse, the actual 10 day master cleanse with the saltwater flush and all of the proper uh, ingredients? So Iowa Viking says, wish I could do the cleanse, but I can't make it at work or I would. Yes, you can actually have a video on my other channel, Nate Murray, uh, about how to make them before. So you can make like, you can make them all in advance. Um, but you will be running to the bathroom often. That is one thing. Let's see. Pop Herm says, uh, do you know anything about calcium overdose and plants from eggshell vinegar solution? Uh, no, I don't know anything. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, I do know about calcium overdose, but yes, of course you can overdo it. If you, um, if you're giving it to them way too strong or too often, but if you're giving it in the doses recommended, I think it's one teaspoon to one tablespoon a gallon um, maximum. That is, that, that's not gonna be a problem because there's so much water in there that it will flush out, I mean, it balances out. So you can give it to them often, yeah. And you can foliar it to them. Um, really, they like a lot of calcium, but the problem would be if you mix it too strong. So if you're mixing it 
one cup to the gallon or something, yes, definitely, that will be a problem. But uh, for the most part, it's kind of hard to overdose for the calcium. Um, let's see. Rune Master says, about Master Cleanse, I think you mentioned it needs to be specific kind of maple syrup. I make my own, but don't necessarily grate it. Do you think that'll be all right? Yes. So if you make your own, then use the stuff from the last run. Use the last, the stuff from the last run. Uh, when the sugaring, you know, when it's all fresh sap, that, that's the ideal time. It's the darkest. You want the darkest stuff possible. And let's see. Oh, someone said ba oh, baby marl is also known as zucchini. Ah, okay. What was the question then about zucchini? You said something about baby, about maros. And then what was the question? Sorry. Um, yes. Let's see. James Triplett says, read that Epsom salt around plant-based stops slugs. Yeah, I've never uh, seen that to be true. I have not seen that to be true. Um, there's only one thing that stops slugs in my experience, and it will come out in the video soon. So Lady in the Lake says, greetings from Southern California. Love your show. All right. Thanks for stopping by, my friend. Uh, let's see here. And hi, Nate. Would you recommend, Vera says, would you recommend hay, food for rabbits, cardboard, plain or shredded, or comfrey leaves as mulch on raised beds? Um, well, you could do sort of all, except the hay, the thing with the hay is that uh, you will have to then deal with the weeds because the hay will bring in hay stuff, you know, seeds. It will bring in lots of seeds. And so um, that would be the main drawback of the hay. Now, if you have access to a lot of hay and you want to you want to use like the root stout method, then uh, that can be wonderful. But the root stout method has to be done. It has to be really committed to it. And you have to use a lot of hay. Uh, because I did this at the Temple Garden uh, for several years, and it takes an astonishing amount of hay and grass to do the Ruth Stout method properly on any kind of scale. You can do one little potato bed or something, but when you're trying to do like corn and beans and squash and all kinds of other stuff, the Three Sisters and all that with the Ruth Stout, um, it works great, but you have to keep the mulch real heavy. As soon as you see weeds, you put down more hay. As soon as you see more popping through, you put down more hay. And so you've got this thick layer of mulch and it takes several years to really get going. But once it does, it is beautiful soil. It really is. Um, but that being said, I think you're just asking about mulch for the raised beds. So out of all of those, I would do the cardboard. Yeah, I would do the cardboard definitely. In fact, if, if you're just about to put it down, then I would put the comfrey leaves down and then put the cardboard over it and then uh, weight that down. Because the main problem with cardboard is it flies away or it can fly away. But if you can weight it down with sticks or with staples or with uh, rebar or rocks or whatever it is, then uh, it's going to work good. Yeah, the cardboard works pretty good. So, but it doesn't last. I mean, it will, you have, you, it's not very sturdy. You know, if you start walking on it when it's wet and stuff, that's going to be an issue. But yeah, uh, cardboard will work really good for that situation. That's what I would do. Um, <clears throat> I am Spartacus says, what do you recommend for grow lights? Yes, please watch my video I made. Uh, I made two videos this spring about uh, gr start seed starting. And one of them is the seed starting masterclass where I tell you guys the five things that plants need. What are they? Light, water, air, nutrients, and it all has to happen at the right temperature. And uh, so I go over all five of those factors in depth and I show you that for light, for seed starting, it is totally acceptable to use LED shop lights from the store. But you have to check for a couple of things. You want to check to make sure that it is of a, a high enough lumen, meaning high enough intensity. And you want to check to make sure that it's the proper K spectrum. Um, so watch those videos. One of them is the master class uh, of seed starting. One of them is seed starting for the budget and beginner. And so both of those, I go over the lights and I show you exactly which one you can use. But um, you just have to make sure that the K, you want the K, the K to be um, about 4K and higher, okay? A anything below that, um, I think th 3K, I, I, I would have to look at the box right now, but uh, I think 3K is what most of them are. 4, 4K and higher is what you want. They make them now in 6500K, so uh, that's almost a daylight spectrum. So that's really good. That's what you, you can use those. But they're just the standard LED shop lights. You don't need grow lights unless you're going to fruit them or flower them indoors. Once you start talking about flowering or fruiting indoors, everything changes. Then you have to think about spectrum. They need the par value and the red light versus the blue lights and all this. 
they need specific stuff and you're going to have to really up the intensity if you're talking about flowering or fruiting plants inside but if you're just starting talking about seed starting then yes you can just use the shop lights and they work magnificent and they're very cheap um let's see erica jackson says oh yeah good ironwort tea the greek mountain tea um ironwort and mint from outside super delicious very good um yeah one of you guys told me it was ironwort is the american name or the english name for it um, but greek mountain tea when i lived in greece it just grew everywhere and everybody was drinking this tea all the time except they used really good honey with it as well some of the best honey in the world honey george man was a good friend of mine in Greece and he had like a hundred beehives and we were constantly eating fresh honey and bee pollen and all kinds of stuff. Um, so I really learned a lot there. Yeah, it was wonderful. Thank you, George. Uh, any vegetarian alternatives to the fish fertilizer, trying to avoid using animals, etc. Yes. So if you want to use, um, alternative to the fish fertilizer, well, really any of them. I mean, the urine would be probably the closer one because the fish is, is a good nitrogen source. It's got other things in it, many other things, but it's a, it's a high nitro source. So if you're wanting leafy, luscious, leafy growth, you want the fish fertilizer. So we give them that um, for the first half of the season, we give everything the high nitrogen type stuff. Even though we don't really dissect them to N, P, and K like like chemical fertilizers because it's all, it's all just balanced. Um, we, we we still it still leans one way or the other so for the first half of the season we're using things like the urine and the the fish fertilizer uh and because we want to really get that leafy growth and that good infrastructure even on things like tomatoes and cucumbers and squash we want them to build the big infrastructure nice and healthy uh so that then they can use all those solar panels to set the fruit and that is uh, how we get the good stuff that is disease free but so for the vegetarian alternative to the fish fertilizer, the closest thing would be pretty much just the urine with the grass, just the wild grass fertilizer or the crop residue fertilizer. You know, um, a good fertilizer, how, how many of you guys have uh, cover crops? Because right now the, the, um, the uh, winter rye and the winter wheat is like three feet tall already. I mean, it's just a week or so away from, from setting the seeds, so that's when we're gonna terminate it. But we're gonna have tons of biomass, of plant matter. And this stuff's gonna be really high in nitrogen. And so one of the best fertilizers that you can make is to cut down all of that uh, crimson, or the, any of your cover crop, crimson clover or winter rye, winter wheat, whatever cover crop you've chosen, mammoth red clover, uh, cut that all down to the ground level and then put it into the barrel for the liquid fertilizer that that would be probably the closest alternative to the fish fertilizer as far as vegetarian option yeah because that's going to have and that's going to break down fast when you put it into the barrel and with a couple shovels of the high quality leaf mold and the water and you let it ferment in the sun like that uh, right out by the crops that's going to be ready to use it's going to smell gnarly yes but it will be ready to use within just a couple of weeks and you can use it all season as a real high nitro source. Um, let's see. What method used to sprout sunflower seeds for eating sprouts to remove the shell? Uh, to remove the shell, yeah. Well, you have to soak them first, definitely. And uh, if you have a batch that is prone to um, uh, molds, you can add just a small splash of uh, hydrogen peroxide to the seed soak. Because uh, you want to soak sunflower seeds for microgreens, you want to soak them for about 12 hours. And uh, you can add a splash of uh, hydrogen peroxide or the labs. That will also help to keep the molds down. Uh, but then as they're growing, you, uh, you have to keep them moist and you have to brush them every day. That's the number one thing, is that as they're growing, you have to brush them. Uh, it's a lot harder to remove, and I'll make videos on this next winter, it's a lot harder to remove homegrown sunflower seeds from your microgreens than it is the black oil sunflower seeds that you buy from like the true leaf market or something the links in the description the if you go there and you get the black oil sunflower seeds the small ones or the large ones um they're, they're like they're designed to uh the shell falls off really easily so as they're growing you just go in there and you just run your hand across it a couple of times and that pretty much should do it that should make it come off now the homegrown sunflower seeds are different those ones are hard to get off uh, i mean when i use those i almost have to pick each 
one off of the plants, which can be very laborious. Um, let's see, Munda says, how do you do a master cleanse? Check out the videos. I have a whole master cleanse playlist on my other channel, my original channel. It's just Nate Muri, M-U-R-I. I put a link in the description to that channel and you can check out the master cleanse playlist. Uh, let's see. Yes, I did the 10 days with mostly, oh yeah, you were doing the K-Rob molasses. Okay, good, good. Okay, so you had a good experience though, yes. Um, the first I've heard of anyone doing the Kara molasses, yes. Although I use molasses in mine as well, but just sugar cane molasses. Uh, I thought you had to drink it right away with the lemon. Yes, uh, yes, Iowa Viking, yes, you do have to drink it right away, but there is a way. If, if you can't do it, then there is a way to do it. I made a video showing you how to do it properly, um, where you, I won't get into it here, but you can check that video out. It's on my other channel. Um, what is the name of your other channel? Yes, I have two other channels. I have Nate Murray and then I have Travel Like a Viking. So if anyone wants to check out some traveling narratives, those are a lot more just for fun. I kind of act out some things. You know, I, as most of you know, I spent 10 years uh, sort of traveling the world and had all kinds of um, pretty far out experiences over the years in different countries and things. And so I uh, did Travel Like a Viking channel where I'm start, I've am um, i made some videos, you know, sort of illustrating all of that because this was before the days of just having infinite storage on your cell phone and you could just go around you know recording everything these guys i see traveling stuff now and i'm just like man back when i started traveling we had digital cameras of course but but i had to go to the internet cafe and then download uh, just my pictures to a cd and then ship the cd back home to my parents where they would then keep it until i got back you know, and it was only, I had memory cards that were 500 megabytes. That, and I remember, whoa, I, I got a big one gigabyte card. Uh, and that was like, whoa, big deal. But you couldn't just take endless amounts of videos and all that stuff. So therefore, now when I'm trying to, on this video platform, make videos about that stuff, I have to like act out a lot. I'm, it's all about storytelling a lot more. So check that out if that's what you're into. Uh, I will be making more this winter. I know I said it last winter, but I was focused on this channel last winter, but I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to make that many videos over this winter on this channel because they just don't do that well. You know, people aren't talking about gardening and stuff. So uh, let's see here. Frank says, Nate, can the eggshell vinegar solution be diluted and mixed in a health drink as a dietary supplement? Yes, I don't see why not. In fact, I have done that before. Yes, you can do that. Uh, utilize apple cider vinegar then if you're going to make it utilize the apple cider vinegar with the mother and then uh, yeah absolutely you could use that then and uh, dilution rate you know start with a teaspoon uh, I mean you just have to see what the what the taste is but really really if if you're hardcore and if you some people typically already do a vinegar solution that they as an internal cleanse and as a health tonic so you can um, make that just with that vinegar instead and that would just add a lot more calcium to the body so yeah because nothing really alters in the vinegar so much I mean it's still very much alive if you're using the apple cider vinegar so uh, you can use that as the health tonic let's see Ms. P good to see you here says FYI didn't get any notifications from YouTube I have a phone alarm set but you still want notifications sent maybe set up a pre-show notice or 15 minute intro that runs before you go live as others do Ooh, I never even thought of that that's a good idea uh, I'll have to look into that pre-show notice or a 15 minute intro what do you guys think about a 15 minute intro so I would start it at 11:45. is that right or I would start it at noon uh, Stone Creek says, hi, Nate. I'm mulching plants with year-old pine wood chips. Is that okay? Uh, yes, not a problem. Have they started to break down? And so long as you just mulch around them, yes, not a problem. That is not going to steal nitrogen from the, the soil like people think it's going to. It doesn't actually happen that way. So uh, as long as you don't mix the mulch into the soil where the roots are, everything will be fine. If you just use the wood chip mulch and put it on top, then you don't have to worry about that, um, stealing nitro or anything. And then go ahead and apply. If you've got the fish fertilizer or the urine or the grasses, any of the fertilizers from the channel uh, that are high in nitrogen, go ahead and apply those right over the mulch. That's going to help really to make sure. Uh, Marcel says, can you grow the... The seeds you find them in, those tiny seeds, will they sprout? 
Uh, oh, yeah, definitely. But you have to, okay, if you have to, um, you're talking about zucchinis. Um, you, in order to save seeds from a zucchini, you have to let it go all the way until it gets like enormous and it turns orange and, and sort of till it's fully ripe. That's when, uh, because we actually, when we pick zucchini to eat, they are, um, they are small. They're, they're going to be small and uh, immature. The seeds are going to be immature. So if they're small, the seeds, and it's an immature one that, for eating, pretty much no, you can't because they're not mature yet. But if you, uh, at the end of the season, let them go super long so that they get big and just monstrous looking and orange and yellow uh, till they almost get a little bit soft and start to rot, then that's when you want to save the seeds. Um, let's see, my cucumber and squash seedlings sprouted like weeds. All right, good to hear, moon dust. Kimberly says, I have straight up cow manure, plant struggling, too much salt. Um, okay, straight, I mean, you planted into straight up cow manure because that can be a little bit too much salt. Also, it could be not enough plant available nutrients yet. You know, it hasn't quite broken down. Um, but I would have to see, there's so many factors involved because uh, what's the temperature like? How long have you, have the plants been in there? And uh, it probably just, they haven't developed the relationship yet with the soil microorganisms and the mycorrhizal fungi and all of that. So uh, in order to draw the nutrients out from that. So you need to feed them additional nutrients in the form of like compost extract and then get the life happening uh, by adding the labs or the, um, the uh, um, Jadam microbial solution or the compost teas, which you will see soon on this channel. We'll do a few this year of the aerated compost teas just to give you guys another thing to put in your arsenal, okay? Because it also works really well. Um, hello, Jason Knight. Let's see, does cardboard attract termites? Not in my experience. Uh, Vera says, thanks, Nate and PA. Yes, what? That what I have been doing, using the tomato cage to hold it down. Okay, good. Uh, my town has free wood chips, works great. Very nice. Uh, yes, like button, thank you, ghost dog. Like button helps the channel, guys. Yes, please hit that like button. We want to grow the channel so that we have as uh, many people participating as possible. Let's see, Marcus or Medicus says, anyone have a great suggestion for pill bugs, roly polies, question mark. Um, I, not so much because I've never found them to be a problem. Uh, they're everywhere in the garden, but I've never noticed them destroying anything. So if you guys have any, um, yeah, even when I was in California and stuff, we had them, but there is not, they were not a problem. So if you guys have any suggestions, let Medicus know. So just go ahead and type it out for the roly polies. Uh, Marcel says, do you like fishing? Oh, yes. I, I like fishing to catch something, though. I'm not like the catch and release kind of guy because I don't like get into it like that. Like, oh, you know, but I like to fish to catch something and eat it or eat it in another way by turning it into fertilizer. So, uh, yeah, I do. Definitely. Uh, Moondust says, care to explain what ironwort is? Ironwort is this tea that I'm drinking. It is a uh, herb that grows. It, it's the English name for Greek mountain tea, basically. It's a, some kind of herb that grows in the mountainsides and stuff uh, in Greece. And it's very delicious, very invigorating, very good for you, all kinds of benefits, antioxidants, all the good stuff. And um, they just drink it all the time. And uh, yeah, they're... That I lived in a I lived in a village in Greece and Palaros is a small village uh, on the Ionian Sea uh, near Lefkada and uh, there it was like uh, all the houses are made of stone and everything it's like a blend of the modern world but with the old old world and I mean many of the houses are hundreds of years old and stuff stone stacked on you know that kind of thing and uh, they still have all the old ways uh, a lot of them and I hung out with this guy Yorgo Meli uh, Honey George. And uh, he showed me so much, man. He's living with the land. He had a, a ranch, a property with olive trees and all kinds of, made his own olive oil, made his own honey and all kinds of good stuff. And picked the, picked the iron wart. He showed me all these herbs and, and uh, oh man, it was just a really fantastic learning experience in life. You know those experiences when you, you don't know why you're in it, but once you're out of it and looking back, it's just like, it takes your breath away. It's like, man, that was just one of the most magnificent experiences of my life. You know, just the whole time period in life, learning and, uh, you know, meeting people and sharing experiences and love. It was just awesome. So, yeah, that's what Iron Ward is. 
to me. Uh, Mart Medica says, I'm hoping to successfully grow Greek mountain tea. Got a rocky pile. I'm going to try growing it on. Yes, that should work. Pile of rocks. That's where I've seen it growing mostly. And uh, can you add kitchen scraps and molasses to already brewing compost tea or is that unneeded? So um, if you're already aerating it, no, you don't want to add the kitchen scraps or the molasses. Once you start the aeration process, that's it. It's 24 to 48 hours maximum. If you're doing a foliar aerated tea, it's about 12 hours of, of brew time. Okay, so um, we don't we don't try to keep it going and add stuff because there's a lot of other factors involved. It's more than just the molasses food, you know. So no, we we make we make them fresh. The microbial brews and the the um, the uh, like the ferments and stuff that we use, like the J Dom, that we add more to. Yes, we never add molasses to those, but we add more plant material. Uh, as, as we get it, we can put it in. It doesn't matter because that's an anaerobic fermentation that breaks down using a different method um, than the aerated compost teas. So Val says, going to try microbial solution this morning again. No luck the last three times, which is weird because it works so well in the past. I think it's because it's too cool. It's too cool or you got to try something you got to check out your potato source or you got to check out um, something like uh, maybe your leaf mold has gone too dry but I don't know yeah there can be a lot of strange things uh, that happen to it but that's why a lot of you guys are gonna like the aerated compost teas because um, it's a little bit different a little bit easier Ms. T, good to see you here. She says, greetings, Nate and wonderful mind likers. I'm late at work trying to sneak a peek. So glad to be in sync with my people. Peace and blessings. Yes, my friend. Positive energy and blessings to you as well. So uh, Erica says, thanks so much. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, PA says, I just peed a 20 liter barrel full this week. Holy, yeah, wow, nice. That means you're hydrated, man. Uh, let's see. Mom General says, I, I read radishes help repel cucumber beetles when planted at the base of the plants. I'm going to try it. That's the first I've heard of that. I'm not sure uh, about that, but maybe I should try that. Yes. Uh, Chick Eastwater says, I like roly polies. The, they only eat dead wood, leaves, and plants. And plants. Uh, dead leaves and plants. Excellent composters, very rare. They go for fresh plants. Right, that, that's my whole mentality as well. My experience is that they don't really, even if there's a bunch of them, I've never noticed them doing anything doing anything destructive in the garden. So um, Kimberly says, how do I calm the cow manure down? Well, you hot compost it for one, you can do that, where you turn it and you'll uh, put the cover over it, keep it moist and stuff. And uh, that can work if it heats up to the right temperature, that can work pretty good, uh, it takes a couple of weeks. Um, or you can let it mellow out naturally, or you can make a liquid fertilizer out of it. And that's a really good method because then you can use immediately uh, the cow manure. But if you've already spread it, spread it all the way around, then there's not a whole lot you can do unless you can add the labs solution um, because that is going to help break it down and become plant available much quicker so you can make the labs and apply that at two ounces per gallon of water soak in the manure and uh, that's going to really help yes and you can also cover the the cow manure with uh, leaves and so that will keep it evenly moist and that'll help to break down a lot faster let me see somebody uh whoa i'm way behind on the chat on the on the uh, a sweeping page, $10, thank you very much, my friend. It says, thank you for answering my Master Cleanse question on your other channel a few weeks ago. You're very welcome, my friend. Thank you for your presence here and there. Val, of course, thank you, $5. Says, thanks for sharing your knowledge, Nate. You are very welcome, my friend. Uh, let's see here, okay, so. Linda says, thanks from South Carolina for helping me with my seedlings, broccoli, Rabe and Tahitian squash coming up in one day in coming up in one day in my soil blocks. You are amazing and we appreciate you so much. You're very welcome, my friend. Coming up in one day. That's incredible. Uh, so that's pretty cool then. It must be nice and warm there. Tahitian melon squash, guys. If if you are looking for a squash this year, everybody listen. If you are looking for a squash this year and you want something Jurassic, uh, and you want something that is going to produce uh 
huge amounts of food that is gonna store all winter long, then get the Tahitian melon squash because uh, that is where man, they grow, they can, if, if it's given, they're very hungry plants. So if you have like a pile of cow manure or a pile of horse manure, that's where you wanna put the, the um, squash and the watermelons and things like that that are really hungry. Um, you wanna put them in a real rich source. So you, if you have a pile of the cow manure, even if it's unfinished, you can um, plant them in that. And they will grow a thick stalk on it, 30 feet long. And there'll be like seven of these massive uh, um, things like this, these squashes like this. And some of them were like this big around and like that big, 30 pounds. I mean, some of them were huge. I don't know about 30 pounds. That, that might be an exaggeration, but huge. Um, and the cool thing is with the Tahitian melon squash is that it's got a big old long neck on it. So it's basically like a butternut squash except with a massive long neck. And there's no seed cavity in the neck or nothing. It's just pure orange winter squash. And so and the cool thing is that you can take that Tahitian melon squash, cut off a portion of it that you need, and then put the rest back in the basement or on the counter or something, and it will develop like a, a skin over the part that you cut, and it will remain good until you wanna use it again within a couple of weeks. Once you start cutting into one, you gotta use it within about two weeks. But uh, it can just sit out on the shelf, and I still have some in the basement from last year, and they're still perfectly good, and uh, we can eat them anytime. Although now I'm on the Master Clean, so I'm not eating them, but yeah, you guys wanna check it out. Um, Okay, Tree Rogi says, what's the best flowers to plant around gardens? Well, that is gonna depend on so many factors. I say if you have to just, I say the marigolds because you can't beat their pest repellent properties. They have all kinds of pest repellent properties and uh, you can make a pesticide with them at the end of the year and they're beautiful and they're low maintenance and um, I, I just really like them. So I have marigolds all over the place. Also, the calendulas, those are very good at repelling pests and very easy to grow. In fact, they can self-seed. Calendulas can grow, flower, set seed, fall down, and grow and set flower again in the same year. It's crazy. They can do that, multiply like that in the same season. Uh, so, yeah, you got to watch out for that. But they're beautiful flowers and uh, very good pest repellent capabilities. And you can make uh, tea from the calendula. You can make tea from uh, also from the marigold. Um, so those are two really good ones, probably my top, my top two favorite as far as pest repellent qualities. And then the mints and stuff like that are really good, uh, but they will spread wild all over the place. So you gotta be careful. Um, and I like the coxcomb as well. The, um, Indiana giant coxcomb. If you watch my video, seven pest repellent plants, I made it a long time ago. Uh, then I show you my favorite list of pest repellent plants and why, and then I show them to you, I think in the garden. So, uh, yeah, check this out, guys. Look, uh, this is uh, the ginger. Yeah, this is why I must have been forced to put it in vertical mode so that I could show you the ginger. Look at uh, how vigorous that is. So this is going to, this is way longer. Last year, it was only about this tall by this time. And uh, so I don't know. I mean, the system was dialed in this year. But yeah, it's, uh, so we're going to plant this out at the same time that we plant tomatoes and stuff like that. So we're gonna plant that stuff out at that time. And uh, that is, cause they don't like any kind of, they don't even like temperatures below 50 really. The ginger is a tropical plant. And so uh, you want to have it uh, planted at the same time as peppers and tomatoes. So yeah. So, and let's see here, let's see. Andy Russell, $4, thank you very much my friend. I appreciate the tip. Kimberly Frying for five dollars. Thank you very much, my friend. And don't stress, Dave. Nate will see it. Ooh, see what? Let's see here. Uh, Dave, you're never gonna see. Oh, I see your post that says you're never gonna see my post. Well, you gotta post it again, my friend. So I mean, there's this boom, boom, boom. There's a bunch of these questions coming. So you know, I get the ones I can. Uh, Rhonda says, aren't the Tahitian squash vine borer magnets? Aren't they used as a trap crop? I've never heard that. And in fact, they're one of the few that I never had the vine borers on. So uh, I don't know where you have heard that, but that has not been my experience. Um, let's see here. Thanks for letting me know I'm in the right path. Yes, you're very welcome. 
Jason Knight says, I have to keep my chickens up. So I put pieces of plywood in the bird cage so I can loft it up and boom crickets and pill bugs along the uh, yeah, along with the occasional grass snake. Chickens eat them all. That's a very good idea, yes. Um, let's see. All I see from Dave is help, please. I don't even see the question. So, uh, okay. Put, uh, put I tin the potato brew and keep kept it at 75. Not sure what the question is, Dave. So you will have to uh, ask it again. Let's see here. Jenny Simon. Hello, my friend. She says, uh, OMG, I'm late. I'm going to set an alarm. Every Saturday, 12 noon Eastern time. Is it every Saturday, same time? She says, yes. Yes, it is. No, it's not just whenever, every Saturday, 12 noon Eastern time. That's New York time. Either way, it's totally fine. I was just going to plant some ginger I sprouted in water. Going to put it in soil now. Now's a good time for the ginger. Did you just see the ginger that I had out here? Because this stuff was totally crazy. And uh, we don't trim the ginger. And so this is one thing that uh, the ginger, every single plant, every bit of uh, this plant has the ginger essential oil in it. So the leaves, the roots, the rhizomes, obviously, uh, the shoots, all of it can be used as tea. It all smells and tastes like ginger. Uh, so all summer long, when it goes outside, it gets a lot more bushy and vigorous, and these leaves get a lot bigger. Uh, it's just totally outgrown its, its, um, its house right now. But yeah, that's uh, what you want to do. So uh, I want to take this opportunity to say thank you to a couple of people, okay? So uh, these are the people using the link in the description to make a donation to the PayPal account, which is wonderful because that, along with the super thanks and along with all of that, helps me to keep uh, the channel Patreon free so that I'm not secluding uh, uh, the information, you know? So I would like to say thank you to Cynthia V, uh, Tatiana M, Brenda M, Marie Brigitte, 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 Marie Brigitte, Scott M, Marcus W, Paulina N, Shiona M, uh, Il, E I E L. How would you say that? Il R. Cool name. Uh, Joanne, of course, thank you. I hope that the job search is going well. If that's what you really want, you know, it's okay to not have a job for a while. Don't worry about it. Uh, Gloria P, Randall L, Gary S, Margaret H, Donald H. Um, uh, a name called Plum Smart. Thank you very much. Jason L, Mariana K, and Justin M. Thank you guys very much. You helped to keep the channel going, and I appreciate it all. So, uh, <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, Ehab, Nate, I planted butternut squash last year. They just sit there doing nothing and keep losing lowermost leaves to diseases. Really? Well, aren't you in like um, Iran, I I Iran or Iraq, somewhere like that, that, where it would be really hot because they can't take just the blazing hot. So maybe that might head, you'd have to grow them sort of in the cooler time period. I, I would have to see what your climate is like, but also they're really hungry. They're hungry plants. And remember guys, if a plant is healthy, um, then it can, it can defend itself against pests or predators or any of that kind of stuff for the most part. Um, with, with exceptions, but for the most part, if you have a healthy um, plant, it can defend itself. And so how do you get a healthy plant? You have to make sure you have thriving soil. Everything begins and ends in the soil. And so uh, if your soil is bursting with life and organic matter, uh, with good nutrient cycling, then uh, you, any plant that you put into it is going to do just fine. So uh, let's see, Chris One, finally I get to hear you live, changed the way I garden and made me love it. Man, that is awesome. Thank you very much for sharing. Uh, and I'm glad that that happened. So uh, let's see, half bubble of plum, half bubble off plum. <laughs> That's a funny name. Um, afternoon, everyone from Northeast Florida, better late than never. That's right. So uh, let's see, and attention. Jay Dixon, 236 people trying to get attention. Try using at garden like a Viking highlight at the beginning and state your question clearly. Oh, very good. Yes. Jay, I think you're like a moderator on one of the other channels, aren't you? I think I saw you uh, one time maybe on uh, Gardner Scott's channel. Is that right? Uh, if it's the same Jay Dixon, Dixon, which I assume it is. 
But yes, that's a good idea, actually, uh, to put do like what Jay says here. Try using at Garden Like a Viking if you have a question. So because there's a lot of people having sub conversations, which is totally cool. That's what it's all about, exchanging knowledge. But if you got a question for me, try doing that uh, so that I can see it uh, more. Because I still haven't seen Dave's question. So um, read of Urentia, brother Nate. What should I do to counteract the wood chips that got interspersed into the potato barrels of last year? Thanks. Okay. So, ooh, so you have wood chips in the actual soil. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, you, you will need to. Um, you will need to. Uh, okay. Real quick, I'm gonna get to that. Okay, Dave has mold on his JMS. Okay, we'll talk about that in a moment. That's what Mom General says. Uh, Brother Nate, okay, so Reed says, wood chips interspersed into the soil, the potato grow bags. Okay, it's not the end of the world. So what you will have to do is you'll have to add some high nitrogen sources of stuff. Now, you will have to um, add like the fish fertilizer is gonna be very effective. The urine, the grass JLF, I know I sound like a broken record, but these are the base of everything. And so if you add enough of the nitrogen source, then uh, it's not going to be an issue because that wood chips can soak up some. See, to break, in order to break down carbon, well, fungi break down carbon by themselves, slowly, slowly. They, release, they secrete enzymes that digest it and then slurp it back up, basically. Uh, but the, um, the bacteria... Their engine, like the engine of decomposition, bacteria is the main decomposers that we want in the garden. Most vegetables prefer bacteria. And so bacteria de decompose our stuff fastest. And so uh, we want the bacteria to decompose those wood chips in, that are in the soil. And so the engine, the, the, the gasoline for the, um, the bacteria is nitrogen. So their food is nitrogen. So that's why people think it ties up nitrogen in the soil. And it does directly where it's in contact around the wood chip, yes. Because we're talking microscopic scales, guys. We're not talking like th things that reach several feet into the soil and stuff like that. Um, but that being said, if you add a nitrogen source, that is going to give the bacteria what they need so that it can uh, really decompose that um, carbon in the wood faster and more efficiently so that you're not sitting there having those wood chips suck carbon sort of out, out of your soil. Um, you, you'll notice that. I mean, I've done it many times in the past. I mean, I, I had it happen to me many times before I really got to understand this. That uh, And then the plants would just be yellow. They would just kind of be like, they would just stunt and they would not really grow well. You got to hit them with that nitro, okay? And you got a foliar with it as well. Uh, and okay, let me stop everything and go back to this question. Jay Dixon says, um, at Dave, at Garden Like a Viking, Dave wrote, need help with JMS. Put in potato brew at 75F and it molds in two days. Okay, so what are you saying is mold? Um, so th there is no, okay, I know what you're talking about. It's like a slimy mold over the top of it, isn't it? And uh, or it can get like a pink or a blue. That is some kind of, an, it just happens sometimes, and that is some kind of an issue with either the leaf mold not being vigorous enough, alive enough, um, maybe it got too dry for too long, or maybe it came from an area that wasn't really bursting with life, uh, or there was something wrong with the potato in some way, or the water, you didn't let it de-off-gas uh, enough. But whatever it is, it didn't take. So once you start seeing that after two days, you throw it out and start over. So um, put the, this time crank up the uh, thermostat. If, if it's at 75, if you're using a thermostat, crank it up to about 80, just so that we can make sure, okay? Because everything happens slower. The, the lower the temperature, everything happens slower. But the higher the temperature, it happens a lot faster and with more vigor to it. So um, that is what I would recommend. You just have to throw it out and you have to start over, but check your leaf mold. And you have to make sure that it's coming from a really um, robust source. Okay, uh, let's see here. And the um, Chuck Toop says, Garden Like a Viking. Uh, Nate, can I use uh, weeds clean from beds in my grass JLF barrel? Absolutely, yes, you can use that in your JLF. Put them in there, no problem. Especially early spring weeds are full of nitrogen. So yes, you can put them in there. Um, and I'm going to show you guys how to make some fermented plant juice, uh, FPJ pretty soon. And for that, we will need, uh, some weeds, some fast growing weed tips. You will see, um, 
Chuck says, Nate. Oh, wait. No, I already read that. Um, and uh, Angie says, any suggestions for stink bugs on tomatoes? I get overrun. Northern Indiana here. Oh, I also am Northern Indiana. Um, stink bugs. I've never had an issue with that. But I would say to add the Jerusalem artichoke. If you watch the video about the um, how to make it from the Jerusalem artichoke, that is what I would recommend. Um, make it from that and uh, use the JWA and you could also use the, um, the other, it's multifaceted. So it, it's not, it's not like in chemical pesticides and stuff. You say, okay, use this and it's going to just wipe out everything, you know, like, um, uh, what is the, uh, uh, I, I forget what, I forget what some of the names even are. It's been so long since I've ever even used those, but yes, it's different than that. So we need to use multiple different, um, uh, approaches, multiple different formulas. So watch the video I made about the pepper and the garlic, and you can make that and have some of that. Okay. So, so you have a few jars of that, put it in jars like this, and uh, then you can make the mint and oregano one, put it in some jars like this, and then you can use those together and the Jerusalem artichoke one with a little bit of the wedding agent. And I know it sounds complicated, but it's not really. So you just make them, you just boil them and you strain them out, watch the videos. Uh, and then you'll have them for some time. And so you just add psh, psh, a little bit of each, you know, to the sprayer uh, with uh, some of the probably two ounces a gallon of the um, JWA. And then you will spray the plants. And between all of those different things, it will generally deter most pests and they won't become an issue. So um, let's see here. Jenny says, kind of two different questions. Sorry, wake and bake. Well, that'll do it to you. Um, let's see. How would I know when my JLF is ready for use and stabilized to store? Um, so the, the JLF, you pretty much just leave it in the barrel. So you leave it in the bucket and you use it. It's a perpetual kind of thing. Red brick melted everywhere says this. Uh, so it's a perpetual kind of thing. So you can just, um, after a couple of weeks, when you start smelling the ammonia and stuff like that, you can start using it. And uh, you'll skim the water off the top, use that in your brews, but then you can uh, just let it sit there and break down over time. So my barrels out back, um, I didn't add anything to them since late la since last harvest and last summer, and they are mostly broken down. I mean, I, I just drained them to about half over the winter, uh, but now I go out there and they're mostly liquid. I mean, there was so much stuff I packed in there uh, all summer. You know, one of the barrels was just the um, cover crops that I had of the uh, winter rye, the winter wheat, and the crimson clover, and I packed a whole barrel full of that. It's all totally liquefied now. And uh, another one was just chicken manure that I got from cleaning out my, my friend's coop. Half the 55-gallon barrel full of the chicken manure. And uh, that's pr pretty much totally liquefied now. So, and now it's, it's good. It's, it's plant available and it's uh, going to be food for the microorganisms. It's going to be really good stuff. So you can use it any time along that uh, path. But uh, as far as like storing it, you, you never really get it to the point where you put it in like a separate container and put it on the shelf. I mean, I guess you could if you wanted to, but uh, there's no need for that. So uh, let's see. Lisa T says, thank you. Love your videos. Your thoughts on underplanting micro, micro clover in our bit of lawn. Who's your neighbor? All right. Who's your neighbor? Um, let's see. Under uh, underplanting micro clover in, in our bit of lawn. I'm not. I don't have a lot of experience with that. Not enough to say anything confidently. So I can't tell you. Um, I think Ghost Dog could probably tell you though. He's a lawn care guy. Um, so yeah, I don't have experience with that. I'm not about the lawn. So I turn every inch of lawn, if you can, into growing food of some kind. The entire backyard, every every square inch, is, is now producing food. And the front, as much as I can, because, you know, there's like a, we're, we're like in a, in a neighborhood here, sort of. Well, definitely. And so I, I can't just like go totally wild. But I will once we get the land. Uh, Angie says, any suggestions? Oh, yeah, I already, already did that. And uh, let's see here. Marcel, 35 Czar. What is that? Is that South African uh, something? 
Uh, Marcel, <laughs> yeah, he says, Dave says JMS is molding and not working. Uh, even if he does it, like you said. Also, much love, Nate. Thank you for everything you do for us. Very welcome, my friend. I appreciate you. And uh, yeah, I appreciate the shout out on uh, Instagram. So yeah, all that kind of stuff, guys. If you want to make a shout out uh, and tag me in it, you know, that's really appreciated. You can uh, mention me in the title of your YouTube videos. Uh, and so you can show me your garden or use the hashtag garden like a Viking. In all of your Instagram stuff, just use the hashtag garden like a Viking. Uh, that way I can see it and I can see the progress. It's super cool. So, um, yeah, tag me in all the stuff that you want. And you can, if you tag me, if you make a video like show me your garden and say thanks, Nate, or something, you can uh, put it on your story and I'll put it on my story then. You know what I mean? We got to promote each other like that. So, I uh, appreciate it, guys. And uh, thank you, Marcel. And uh, Jay says, I moderate, facilitate on Gardener Scott every week and help on other garden channels to a lesser degree. That's very nice. It's very nice of you. Yes. Uh, I know I have uh, been needing to maybe do that for some time, but I just haven't um, found. There was one time that there was a real rabble rouser. But other than that, it hasn't been an issue. Um, Dav says, question, if I were to make an FPJ out of weeds and then use it on the lawn, will I be encouraging more of the same weeds to grow? Thanks, Nate. No, you will not. So you don't have to worry about that because um, the FPJ is more about extracting the uh, auxin, the growth hormone and the um, other enzymes and things from the growing tips of the plants. And so it's going to be available so whatever you spray it on it's going to help it to thrive it's just a general the fpj is like a general plant tonic you dilute it a lot it's only one teaspoon a gallon i think um i forget exactly but that's pr i pretty much use one teaspoon to one tablespoon a gallon of water and uh, that's all you need because these it extracts the hormones so that's why it's very imperative that we use just the fresh growing tips because this auxin um positions itself at the highest point of the plant, wherever it's growing, because that's where it wants the, the most growth, fastest growth to happen. So we want to pick those and uh, extract it with the sugar using osmotic pressure. And that is how we do that, which I will show you guys in the video when it comes up. But um, to answer your question, no. You, making it from weeds does not encourage more weeds, no. Uh, Jenny says, how much nitrogen does kelp have? How much greens can be seaweed and compost? Can you use all seaweed? Uh, I know you can if you just mix it with spent potting mix. Um, kelp has a lot of good stuff. Kelp is wonderful. If you can get actual kelp, if you're blessed enough to live by the ocean like that, then yes, you can use that. You can ferment it in the barrel. Also, you can compost it. It has all kinds of micronutrients in it. So um, that's a really good fertilizer. And how much greens can be seaweed and compost? Pretty much you can use it as your greens if you want. Um, you can use seaweed and leaves or seaweed and straw or seaweed and uh, brown paper bags or whatever the um, carbon source is. You can use that as your green, yes. Uh, let's see here. And... Good morning. Love both of your live shows. Great to see your channels are growing. Thank you, Brian. Yes, he's talking about the live we do every Monday at 12 noon on my other channel, Nate Murray, where we talk about all different kinds of stuff. Some more positive energy. Uh, Wayfaring Farmer says, question, bro, have you taken a JMS bath yet? I have not. I haven't found a need to because I'm already bursting with life and microorganisms. So haven't found a need to. Have you? Uh, Grizzly Adams says, made JMS for the first time and it did well. I read it should be made at around 75 degrees. I made it in my basement, but my soil temperature is about 45. Is this okay? Yeah, that's not gonna be a problem um, because the microorganisms are still going to um, do their thing. So yeah, 75 degrees is about as low as you wanna make it. It still works at 70 degrees, but it doesn't happen fast enough any lower than that. So yeah, that's gonna be just fine. Uh, you apply it to the soil, doesn't matter what the soil temperature is, uh, what's gonna stick is gonna stick. So let's see here. I thought I hit the motherboard of ladybugs. 
Turns out they are Asian beetles. Ooh, yeah, I don't want those, huh? And uh, let's see here. Now, happy day to all. What is JWA? Uh, Elena Saucier says that. And yes, JWA is this wedding agent. It's like a homemade Castile soap, and it's very um, powerful. It's also, it's like a pesticide in itself. It can dissolve all kinds of insects and deter insects, but also um, it can be a fertilizer. The microorganisms will convert this to a potassium fertilizer in a matter of days. Uh, so it's actually really good for everything. And it's the foundation of the, uh, of the um, JDOM pesticide, the natural pesticides. So, uh, Mama T says, Hello, Nate. I'm behind. The lab solution is the cheese liquid? Yes, that is correct. Labs is the lactic acid bacteria serum. And uh, Ms. P, regarding stink bugs, I have found that interplanting with an abundance of strongly scented herbs and flowers does confuse the pests and there aren't as many. Absolutely. That is always good practice, guys. If you are trying to deter pests, you need a large diversity of the micro or of the um of the flowers, of the different kinds of plants, because uh, pests really love when there's a whole lot of one crop. And then they really, oh man, when they go from one plant to the next to the next, and it's all the same crop, then they're, oh yeah, then they'll lay their eggs down and boom, they say, okay, we're gonna move in right here. But if they go to one plant and it's an onion, and oh no, like a cabbage moth, for example, if it goes to an onion, and, oh no, we don't like this. And then it flies around, goes to a marigold, oh no, we don't like those. And then it flies around, goes to a cabbage, well, it's, gonna, it's just not as likely to really put down roots there um, because there's so many other things that are deterring it and confusing it. So just remember that. Yes, as many different kind of plants and strongly scented herbs and flowers as possible. Okay. But guys, guess what happened to my, um, to my uh, sweet potatoes? I had them outside kind of hardening them off because we had like a real good stint of weather. And then the day in typical Indiana fashion went from like 70 degrees and sunny all the way down to like 30 something at night. And I almost killed all of the uh, sweet potatoes. It was just tragic. And you can see this, it kind of got them, like frost kind of got to them. And it killed some of them. So uh, they're not looking all that good, but they're all alive. And I saved what I could. I snipped them off and I put them in this um, thing here. And you see, they are already starting to grow. This was just like a couple of days ago. And uh, they're already starting to grow the roots. And these are going to grow nice big roots here. And within the next three weeks, we'll be planting these outside. You see the new growth on them is looking good though. Since I put them in here, they're starting to grow again towards the light. Uh, and I got way more than this. But I was just showing you those. But look over here at the um, sweet potato in the uh, jar method. These are looking pretty good. You know, still slow, but they're going to be right on time. Because just like I've been doing for the past few years. And uh, these have got tons of roots in them, you see. And uh, they are definitely slower than the soil method. But that's not really going to matter that much. Because the soil method actually, um, had, they're too big. So I've had to cut them and trim them. But here you can see these are going to be nice and healthy. So when the time comes, we're just going to grip. See like right here. Here's a shoot coming off. And we're just going to grip there at the base and pull that off. And all these roots are going to come off with it. And this whole little shoot is going to come off. And that is a slip. And we're going to then take that with the roots and everything and plant that. And that is going to produce more tubers. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know if you guys have watched some of my shorts lately. I've been trying to, I've been making shorts and stuff because YouTube's really pushing it. You know, they want you to like make shorts and stuff. But I'm not really liking the type of people that the shorts really attract. It, it just, the comments on the shorts are, are all like, or there's just so many like combative comments and people that, that just, you know, uh, you, you can just tell that they're really the short attention span TikTok kind of people, you know, real easily agitated and they, they just want to put you down and stuff like that. So the shorts are not really, I'm not really feeling them, you know. So because like the sweet potato and stuff, uh, so many people have tried to have made comments about because uh, I said you, you don't just plant sweet potatoes and get more sweet potatoes. You know, you have to do this first. And then I showed how to put it in the soil and start the slips. Um, but everyone, they, they just don't get it. 
So they said, but you literally planted the sweet potato. Bro doesn't know what he's talking about. So, well, okay, my friends, but uh, you just can't give that any mind. You just can't give that kind of people because they don't know and they're just frustrated with their life and they're just easily agitated. They got a short attention span, you know, because of the system and everything. They probably watch TV, you know, and so their, their mind is just little, little 10 second clips is all that they can really focus on and stuff. So you just have to sort of have understanding about these kind of people. So, um, cause you know, a, a lot of people ask me that, uh, about stuff now. A lot of people ask me, um, uh, like in person when I tell them about starting a YouTube channel and stuff and they're like, man, the, I, I just could not deal with all the haters. How do you deal with all the haters? That's like a number one question I get from people in person, you know, when I'm talking to them about it. Uh, and they, they ask me, you know, well, you, you'd have to have thick skin, man to deal with that. And I, I couldn't do that because of all the, the haters and all that and stuff. And I just, you know, the way to deal with them is to not deal with them. You just don't give them any energy really. Uh, and there's a video and, and I'm just telling you this because so there's a video that, um, it's a lion it's to illustrate the mentality that I'm talking about. There's a video that I put in the, in the description of this because I knew I was going to bring this up. There's a video that I put in the uh, description of this video at the very, very bottom of all the other stuff that says uh, the lion video discussed in this video. And you can click on that and watch. It's just of a lion with some hyenas, but it illustrates so perfectly the mentality that you have to have in order to succeed uh, in certain areas and, and really in any area in life. Because watch how the lion, he knows that he's that he's king of his jungle. He knows he's king of his area. And this lion is in the prime of his life and he's full of energy and he's not gonna take it from the hyenas. There's like 30 hyenas right around there. And they're all trying to tr trying to nip at, his, nip at his tail and stuff. And the lion, you know, he, deal, he just kind of blows them off for a while, but then if they get too close, bam! He gets them and pins them down. He kind of killed one of them, you know, just to prove to the other one, stop messing with me. You know, I'm the king of this area. It's just really cool. And then at about four minutes and 20 seconds, you'll see the lion is like uh, eating one of the hyenas kind of, and all the other ones are coming up, creeping closer to it. And the lion just looks back and shows them his teeth like this. And they all <laughs> like that. That's the mentality that you have to have. And uh, so the reason I put that there is because it so perfectly illustrates that you just don't worry about the haters. And this goes for life in general, for just all people. You don't give them energy by focusing on them. You know, the lion's not focusing on the hyenas really because he, he knows. He knows the, the score. And so uh, that is my rant on that, okay? We just don't, f you, how do you deal with the haters? You don't deal with them. You don't give them any energy. You don't make it any more real than it needs to be because they're confused or whatever. So, poof, goodbye. So that's my rant, my friends. Scorpio 1969, $50. Thank you very much, my friend. I appreciate the contribution. It says, love your channel. Have a pile of tree limbs. Are you going to make a video? Also pile of wood chips full with white fungal matter suggested use. Okay, pile of tree limbs. Um, well, if you have, uh, I mean, this year I'm probably not gonna be able to make the biochar video. So I will have to, uh, I will have to do that next year. So um, you can make biochar out of the tree limbs, that's really good. But also, uh, I'm gonna show you guys how to make a fertilizer from bones. And we're gonna use a burning barrel and the tree and the tree limbs. I'm also going to show you how to make a um, really good fertilizer from citrus peels because I've got a mountain of them after doing the master cleanse and I'm having all my friends, there's a number of us doing the master cleanse right now because uh, it's that time of year to cleanse everything. And so they're saving the uh, citrus peels and um, that uh, will also require a burning barrel and the, um, the uh, tree limbs. So that's what I would use those for. Um, but then the wood chips is... Um, Let's see here. The wood chips, pile of wood chips full with white fungal matter. Suggested use. You can compost them. If you have enough green matter, you could use them as a mulch. Um, but probably composting them would probably be the best. You know, if you have wood, uh, grass clippings or if you have uh, manure or any of that, you can, high nitrogen source, you can mix with the wood chips. Um, but if they've already got good colonization with the mycelium and stuff, use it, put it around your fruit trees. If you have fruit trees or nut trees or any kind of trees. Guys, here's one of the number one reasons that, that trees fail is because people will plant a tree like out in their manicured lawn and it's just like a desert of, of life, of microorganisms. So one tree is like out here in a, in a wasteland of just lawn, you know, properly like manicured lawn. With, and and it, so 
there's no relationship with the fungi and it doesn't have the diversity of microorganisms it needs. And so what you do is every time you plant a tree, you put a, a ring of uh, wood chip compost all the way around it, nice and thick, not right up around the stem, the, the trunk, of course, keep that away a bit, but all the way, uh, at least as far out as the drip line of the tree. That's how much it wants. Because remember, the roots typically go out as far as the canopy of the tree. Uh, so you want to put that and that's going to help them establish that good fungal dominance in the soil, the good relationship with the microorganisms. Um, so yes, I hope that that answered the question. Uh, Edelweiss, $10. Thank you very much, my friend. Says, thank you. UPS guy came by, was envious of my garden. I told him about garden like a Viking. All right. That's good to hear. And uh, let's see here. Okay, at Garden Like a Viking, I am also considering urine in the garden. Yes, definitely. Um, at garden, I am also considering urine in the garden. Definitely use urine in the garden. Now, yes, to answer you guys' questions, yes, you can, um, you can use it fresh if you want. But it's not, it, it does something different. I, I forget the exact chemical chemistry, what is exactly happening in the conversion of the ammonia to ammonium or the nitrates, I, I have to brush up a little bit, but um, it, there is a conversion and, and you can see it. If you just take urine, say a gallon of it, and you uh, and it's fresh and it smells, it smells like urine, yes, but it's, uh, it's clear sort of, you, you know, there's not much of a darkness to it. Then you let the same urine set with, you just let it set, then uh, it, something happens and the smell completely changes. And then if you uh, ferment that with the leaf mold, if you if you put it in with the leaf mold and stuff, like you saw from the video, it totally transforms the whole thing so that uh, it smells like something way, way stronger than just urine. And you smell it and it's it's really so potent. And that is why uh, J. Dom recommends to ferment the urine for six months. Also in organic certified farming, it's required that you ferment you, you ferment the urine for six months. And this is for all kinds of reasons, to break down things, um, uh, you know, toxic uh, medications as well. You know, a lot of this. So uh, Sandy Nesta says, don't feed the beast. Yeah, that's exactly right. You, you just don't because you don't have time for all of that. Busy girl. Good to see you here. She says, just ignore them, Nate. They will go away. Absolutely. I, I don't have any, any kind of, it, yeah. Yeah, I know. Just ignore them. Unfortunately, it sort of it makes you a little bit more calloused up towards any comments, you know, but I guess that's it's the nature of it. Once you start having broad enough reach, you're going to have those people, you know, because um, that's just our, our society is kind of being led that way so that people are kind of have short attention spans and they're kind of irritated and they got background just agitation in their life. You know, they don't know why, but they just want to re release it on somebody. You know, um, so I, I get all that, you know, and so I have understanding with that. But at the same time, I'm not going to focus on that because whatever you focus on becomes your reality. This is the kind of stuff we talk about on my other channel on, on the live on Monday at 12 noon. Um, we talk about this kind of stuff that whatever you focus on becomes your reality. The law of confirmation, whatever the internal image is, eventually becomes the external experience. So... Yes. So I'm not going to sit there and uh, I'm not going to uh, sit there and give that any attention. You know, let's see the shorts. Yeah. Oh, man. I know. PA says the lion doesn't lose sleep over the opinion of the sheep. Yeah, I love that quote. That's really good. Um, Linda, you are a master lion. Thank you very much, my friend. I truly feel this way in spirit. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, you guys watch that video and see if it doesn't do for you. I mean, it really makes, it really illustrates perfectly. Um, let's see. Marcel says, send them haters to South Africa. I'll feed them to the gators. All right. I'll make a note of that. Uh, let's see. Oki Ranch says, whoops, garden like a Viking. I made a comment about using the urine mix on crops and boy, did a jack wagon attack me. Oh yeah. Oh, I know. I know. Yeah, they definitely do. The people think that because they sit behind their keyboard and they think that, um, well, it's just different. You know, I've had people talk to me on the internet or speak to me or whatever in ways that nobody ever has in person. It's just different. You know, this whole, this whole, we're in the digital age now, a digital age of no consequences and stuff. Nobody would ever speak to me like that in person. <laughs> 
but over the uh, it's just it's so weird yeah but people a lot of people just want to have something they'll watch they'll watch something and just think okay what can i disagree with what can i disagree with they'll watch it up oh, there it is okay so i can disagree with this so you know it's all egoic stuff you know um and let's see here chuck toops five dollars thank you very much my friend i uh i think i missed one up here earlier wasn't there a uh Scorpio, a Ms. P, $2. Thank you very much, my friend. Says, love to Nate and all the peeps helping each other. Yes, that is what it's all about. Um, let's see. Lisa T says, until we make JWA, do we do we use Brawners? Just starting with my lovely brews. Yes, until you make JWA, use the Peppermint Brawners. Peppermint because we're doubling as a uh, sort of de pesticide deterrent as well. So, yes. Um Let's see, Ursula, not the sweet potatoes. Oh, I know, yeah, it was bad. I mean, they they really got a hammering, but uh, I should have known better. I just didn't think it was gonna plummet to such cold degrees, but you can see the new growth. That's what's important. The new growth is still looking really good. So, um, and yeah, guys, the tomatoes, remember, tomatoes are doing really good. And uh, when we go to plant these, we're gonna cut them here and here, plant it up to here and uh, that will be in about three weeks from now. Mama T says, how do you seed ginger in water? Um, I don't know. I don't know how you seed the ginger in water. I have not used that. But I definitely know that this method works, guys, because this method has got it growing off the chain. So watch my video on that. And uh, we're just going to pull these out of here, and we're going to plant these into a grow bag. Uh, now, ginger can take some shade, okay? Ginger does not need full sun. Um, it, in fact, it like needs a bit of afternoon shade. One of the few plants that really needs the afternoon shade. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Linda says, Nate, can I use oleander in place of the Jerusalem artichoke for pesticide spray? Yes, absolutely. You can. That is one of the certified effective plants from the JDOM system, which, uh, it is oleander and the Jerusalem artichoke and the Korean pasque flower are, um, and the red spider lily, I think, as well, are, are the main ones. So, yes. Um, Freebird says, I am so excited to get my sweet potatoes in. I already have over 60 slips and still growing. Oh, man, you are going to have a uh, you are gonna have a lot of sweet potatoes. That's awesome. Marcel says, what is the hardest thing to grow, Sensei Nate? Uh, well, let me see, Grasshopper. Uh, the... Uh, the uh, hardest thing to grow, there really isn't anything that's hard to grow. I mean, it all depends on where you're at. So things like broccoli and spinach can be tough because they require sort of a mellow season, you, you know. But if you're in the right area, if you're in the Pacific Northwest, you can grow spinach, no problem. But when we're here and it's like 85 degrees in the day, one day, and then goes to like 41 degrees at night, the next night, then that, that just, that distance between the extreme high and the extreme low is uh, what, what signals like spinach to bolt or the bok choy to bolt. So many of those things will bolt um, when the temperature gets, the, the um, temperature is fluctuates too much. But other than that, I don't really, uh, I can't really think of a hard thing. Onions are kind of hard to grow because you have to plant them right. I mean, just in the sense that if you want big, good onions that store a long time, you have to really plant them right. Um, oh, and that leads me to the potatoes, guys, because start chitting your potatoes, okay? So, uh, so these I put, these are a Yukon Golds. I took them out of storage and put them into the um, sun. Uh, well, I put them in a sunny window, and that's how I'm chitting them. So watch the video I made last year about that. And you see they got nice, stout, good chits on them. These are going to be ready to plant in about a week. Um, as opposed to one like this. This one is... Uh, it did this in storage. So this was in the basement. And uh, this one is from last year. And uh, it's really, these these are like lanky chits. These aren't going to be as vigorous. It'll still work. If your potatoes look like this, plant it like this. Um, and put the soil like right here. Bury it like this deep into the soil. Plant it like that. Don't bust these off because if you do, the potato is not really going to have enough energy left. Well, I mean, maybe you could with this one. You could bust these ones off and just leave that one. Um, but there's not going to be enough energy left for the potato to put out more sprouts, really, if you bust these off. So even if they're like this, you can work with it like that, yes. But ideally, you want them to look more like this 
or like this. Now, uh, as far as planting potatoes, these are, you can plant these at this size. See, because they've only, that's a tiny, it's a small potatoes with just one eye, you know, two, two active eyes. That's plenty. So we can plant this whole thing. Also, I'm probably going to plant this one. And this one's got three eyes on it uh, and three chits, you know, sprouts. And so uh, we'll probably knock off like one of these. We'll probably knock off this one and uh, then plant it that way. So I wanted to show to you, though, if you have... Um, if you have, so here's a russet potato. And so if you have this many eyes and this many chits, look, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. There's 16 possible plants on this one potato. So if I planted this, I would get a huge amount of tiny little potatoes. Uh, and that's not what we wanna do. So. What I'm going to do with this is I'm going to cut this. So I will cut probably like, uh, probably like, uh, you know, here so that I can have about three chits, two to three chits per little section. So I'll probably cut this into three sections. I'll probably do it like, uh, right about here and then right about here like that. And then I will, I will let those, uh, harden in the, uh, out in the air, like in uh, the window for a couple of days. And then I will plant those and that's going to give me the best quality of potatoes. Because if you just plant it with all these chits on it, there's just going to be tiny little potatoes. Okay. And um, let's see here. Send them. Okay. Okay. What are we looking at here? Can I use leftover liquid when making regular cheese as the labs? No, uh, you cannot. Because remember, guys, there's two types of cheese. There's the, um, there's the, uh, we'll call the acidic cheese that you add an emulsion or the, the coagulator, like a lemon juice or vinegar or rennet, something like that. And that will coagulate the milk proteins. But the other way is to do it with the microorganisms. And that takes more time, but it takes my, through the microorganism activity, they actually alter the pH of the solution to coagulate the milk proteins. And this way, making it with the labs is bursting with life. But this way is not so much. And because this takes like multiple days, but this one happens in just a couple of hours. So even though they look the same, they look to be both like cloudy liquids from cheese making, they're not the same at all. The labs is bursting with life. The other one is not. So, uh, no, let's see here. Okay. And, um, let's see. Biochar video will take a year. Uh, well, the, the video about making the biochar because I mean unless I can I'll have to go out to my uncle's and uh, use a wood um, it's possible it's possible we'll see we'll see um, but no we used to make it in California all the time and it's very easy to make but I mean I showed you how to charge the biochar that was for the home gardener and stuff but not so much uh, you know it didn't show you how to actually make the the um, char Let's see, Paulina says, yes, the negative only affects you if you allow them to. That's right. Let's see, and okay, where are we at? Where are we at? Where are we at? Let me see, oh, I'm way, I'm way back up there. Oh my goodness. Okay, let me get caught back up. So the lion vid is interesting in that once you're too injured uh, by the victim to run, your fellow mobsters leave you for dead. That's true as well. That's true as well. Yep. You think you're all tough as a mob, but then once you get the one injured, then they all just, eh, well, that sucks for you. <laughs> Sorry, we, we got to go. Yeah. Um, let's see. Jennifer says, I spray whey from yogurt and kefir, diluted one cup to one gallon water to deodorize hen house walls and litter also. Rabbit hutches weekly also add to compost. Very good, yes. Um, the way from the yogurt and the kefir are going to be bursting with life. They're not going to be the same as the labs, but they are going to do some good stuff. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, whey and yogurt kefir to deodorize. That's a very good use of it. Um, Rhonda Williams, have you ever heard of using the water from rooting weeping willow sprigs to use as a rooting hormone? Yes, I was going to make a video on that as soon as I can find an appropriate uh, willow tree to use. But yes, that actually makes a really good thing. And we used to use that all the time in uh, Northern California. There is a solution that we used to spend thousands of dollars on growing in Northern Cali uh, called tappan roots. 
and it's a uh, it's a really it's a really good it's super effective. But then I come to find out. I talked to one of the people that was in the know about making it, and I come to find out he was like, "Man, actually, we just make it. It's a willow extract from the willow tree." And uh, so then I learned how to make that, and we started using that instead. It's very effective and free. Instead of instead of it was like four hundred dollars for the for the five gallon jug, and we would have to use one of those every week. I mean, it was just crazy. So much goes into that, man. And uh, let's see. Um, Marcel, onions are a bit of a pain to grow where I'm at because of inconsistent power outages. Indoor starting is difficult. We have something called load shedding in South Africa because the government's corrupt. Load shedding or load sharing? Yeah. Yeah. When I lived in Thailand, it was like that all the time. We had power outages all the time. Um, Sandy says, some of us will never grow up. That's true. Uh, let's see. Oh, no way, says, you talking a lot of chit today. <laughs> Good one, my friend. Yes, you oregano. I got them garden puns for days. So, but what matters is that you bay leaf in yourself. <laughs> my mom wrote me a card <laughs> last year with all these garden puns on it. It was so funny. I couldn't even, I couldn't even read it without just hysterically laughing. Um... Okay, Mama T says, thank you for answering my question. I'm making a list of acronyms. Yeah, that's the thing. I, I should make an acronym video or something, an acronym chart, because really there's so many acronyms, yeah. And they're so close. JLF, JFPJ, JMS, JS, you know. But once you get the hang of it, then you know. And it's so much easier because you can't, you don't want to just keep saying JDOM sulfur, JDOM microorganism solution, you know. Um, let's see, Gar Lisa says, can you share your wisdom on growing pumpkins? Much appreciated. Yes, actually, I want to make a video and it's going to be uh, very soon on how to grow pumpkins, winter squash and melons in a weed free patch. And yes, we are going to focus. So that's actually going to be the next video I come out with. I think it'll be like uh, probably Tuesday and uh, it will show you it'll be from my trip to Tennessee again and how we created a uh, very nice um, watermelon, squash, pumpkin, any of those kind of things, it's going to thrive in this type of patch. And I will uh, show you all about it in that video. Yes. Uh, Megan says, doing the soil method, once you slip the sweet potatoes off and, oops, once you slip the sweet potatoes off and put them in water, do you have to add any nutrients to the water? No, you don't. You don't have to add any nutrients to the water. Um, but for the most part, they, I mean, cause it's so fast. I mean, these have only been in there like two days and they're already sprouting roots. So, but they're on a heating mat though as well. Most of the time, I mean, all the time they're on a heating mat. So that's super important. Sweet potatoes love the heat so th they can take 80 and 90 degrees. No problem. So uh, you want them, but they do not like it when it gets into the low or the mid thirties, obviously. So yeah, that's what happened to mine, but they'll recover. Everything will be just fine. So, um, let's see here. Let's see. Ehab says, I tried collecting wild asparagus seeds from the woods, but they won't sprout. Very interesting. I don't have experience with that. Uh, Ursula, we have willows in Lakeside Park. Oh, yeah. Okay. We got to make a trip there. Definitely. We got to take a couple of, well, yeah. I don't think they'll mind. So, Val, whoa. I used tap water to boil the potatoes for microbial solution. Did I mess up? It's possible what kind of, um, what kind of uh, anywhere that you're using tap water, guys, remember the tap water is designed to kill microorganisms because they didn't want it growing. You know, they're pulling it out of the river or wherever and then pumping it through miles and miles of pipes and all that stuff. And they don't want anything harmful to get to you. So, with, you know, for a reason, it's designed to um, kill microorganisms. But we cannot have that when we're trying to culture microorganisms. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Oki Ranch says, I started a small Hugel Hill. Can I put whey on it? Absolutely. You can. Yes. Go ahead and put that whey on it. The Hugel Hill. Yeah. The Hugel is another thing that takes time. Okay. You want to, um, it, it takes time to digest and to become plant available. So it, it's almost the thing I recommend to people. If you're going to do the Hugel to make the mound for next year, 
you know, and then treat it almost like a compost pile. And you can be putting uh, urine, the high nitrogen stuff onto it and to really get everything functioning and to help, you know, add some JMS or some aerated, some of the compost teas uh, to get the life happening and the breakdown and the, uh, all of that. Plant a cover crop on it or, but you can also use it the very first year as well. You know, you just have to be a little bit more on it. So yes, you can pour the whey on it. There is a way. Uh, Sandy says, knock, knock, who's there? Beats, beats who? Beats me. Mm, okay, that's a pretty, okay. <laughs> uh, Rhonda Williams. Oh, wow, I thought it would work. I found out about the Willow Sprigs rooting in water by accident, by playing with my youngest son when he was young. Yes, that's how some of the greatest things are found, by accident. Uh, let's see here. No way, says, I would not mess with the Viking. I sized you up long ago. Yes, thank you, my friend. Wise idea. Um, yes. Do you know of any way to shell hemp seeds at home? The water method uh, did not work. Things randomly float or sink. I only know how to make hemp milk to extract it. I don't. I don't know how to do that. If anybody does have, uh, have experience with that, you can let Ehab know. Um, let's see here. Yeah. And no way says I would not mess with the Viking. I sized you up a long time ago. That's just interesting because, you know, in my younger years, I, I used to be so outwardly, like, um, I just had a whole different fire within me. You know, I, I had this whole like outward thing to, uh, of where I had to, to, uh, it was just a lot more aggression in life and stuff. And then it's like I had these things to prove to people, but mostly to myself looking back on it. And uh, then I left traveling for 10 years and these experiences in the world humbled me. Oh my, uh, uh, humbled me until now. It's just uh, that whole kind of energy. It's like, it's still there if I ever need it. If, I, if the situation ever calls for it, okay, in a heartbeat, the animal can come back out in a heartbeat. But it's not, the, it's not like a burning inferno anymore, that part of it. It's, uh, it's more like a lion that's been tamed. I, I, I can keep it in a cage. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. I just feel it's so, so much more peace uh, with that kind of control. But anyways, Jimmy Crack Corn, $5. Thank you very much, my friend. He says, uh, Nate, do you make your own weed killer? Uh, not really. If I have to, I will use vinegar. You can put vinegar on it in the blazing sun. That will kill any plant that you put on it. Just like white vinegar, um, pretty much just in a spray bottle, just spray it on it. Uh, when the sun is out and blazing, done. So you will see. Whoa, we're already at 97 minutes. This has been a good one, man. I've been, uh, I've been enjoying this one. Okay, so Lisa T says, Nate, your energy lifts me up. Much appreciated, my friend. You are very welcome. Okay, guys, so we will be bringing this to a close pretty soon. Um, if your onions are sprouting from last year, remember, you can plant them. So these are some of the New York earlies that they uh, started sprouting. I mean, obviously, they're like, they need to go outside soon. And once they reach the stage, you can plant them and uh, they will set seeds. They will flower and set seeds this year. You then save them and you use that as your onion seeds next year. So getting onion seeds is a two-year process because they're biennials meaning they bulb the first year, but then the second year they set seed and flower. So uh, yeah, that's what I'm gonna do with those. And uh, here's some catnip, you see, I got it and it's already rooting after just a few days, maybe like one week, the catnip. Shiva, she loves it, yeah. I had to put it up here to keep it out of the way. So, okay, Marcel says, was a darn good live today. Thank you, Sensei, you are very welcome, my friend. I appreciate all you guys being here, man. This is awesome. And let's uh, remember every Saturday at 12 noon Eastern time, we are right here doing the same thing. So bring your questions. I'll give you the best of my knowledge and experience. And um, every Monday at 12 noon Eastern time, we do a live on my other channel, Nate Muri, M-U-R-I. I put a link in the description where we talk about uh, some of the other things, you know, the more mental and, and uh, philosophical type things. So we talk about that kind of stuff, spiritual things. And uh, check out my other channel, Travel Like a Viking, where uh, I'm, so there's 25 episodes so far. Watch them all, get caught up in the story because um, come fall time, I'm honestly, I'm seriously going to hit it hard again and make some more uh, episodes there. And um, 
check out the Garden Like a Viking Instagram account where I'm doing, I put put little updates about stuff in the story all the time, you know? So that is, um, cause I'm finding it really useful about things I don't wanna make videos about. I'm posting reels and in the Instagram story, I'm doing, um, it's always tips and tricks. There's always a purpose. Anything that I post on social media has a purpose to it. I don't just post because, because, I mean, that's just, that's long gone, that kind of desire to do anything like that. So anything that I post has something, a meaning of some kind. So you can count on that, okay? And, uh, okay, okay, yes, ghost dog, glad you made it too. Yes, you have to make sure you let me know how that um, lawn solutions is working this year. And uh, please like button, yes, hit the like button. If you guys are after the fact, watching this after the fact, hit the like button. Um, so uh, also let me know how, how do the commercials show up for you guys afterwards if you're watching it after the fact because I, I go in and try I, I go in and make sure because if you just click monetize on, on it then YouTube generates the commercials and it puts them like every minute and a half just boom 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 there's like 20 commercials throughout this hour and a half and that's totally unacceptable for me so I, I go in there and I delete all but like six of them you know because you want to keep it monetized I mean got to got to make some kind of income with it. So, um, but let me know, is that, so you guys watching it after the fact, what are the commercials like? Cause there should only be one, like every 15 to 18 minutes. That's how I set it up. So, um, because that, that boom, 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 that makes it totally unwatchable. But I do suggest you guys get the YouTube premium, you know, um, even though I don't know if that's hurting the channel, but it doesn't even matter. It's just so nice not having the commercials. I haven't seen an ad since I don't have a television or I don't listen to radio I, and, and my YouTube is uh, all commercial free. I haven't heard an ad in, in like a year and a half. I mean, it's so wonderful. It's so good for the landscape of the mind. So when I go to some place that has the television on, oh, it feels like an assault, you know, because the, the commercials are blah, blah, blah. Hey, come down to Grody Automotive, buy four tires, blah, blah, blah. You know, so we don't need none of that. Taida, $5. Thank you very much, my friend. She says, love your purposeful postings. Yes, thank you. Guys, check out her Instagram account. She does henna, very beautiful, talented henna uh, artist, RK, $3. Thank you very much, my friend. I appreciate you guys getting them tips in there right before the close, right before I close the case. Okay, my friends, I will see you next time. Mm, how do I get out?